Hey everybody, welcome to Onset Audio 101. I'm Rob Akisela. I'm a production sound mixer and post-production sound editor, sound designer, and re-recording mixer in the New York metro area. Um, I'm here thanks to the Strix Media team uh, to put together a little class for you guys. This is primarily aimed at beginners and students who are interested in taking um, you know, some, maybe some limited audio knowledge and bringing it up to the next level for their, their uh, indie productions, school productions, anything like that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things that people come to me and ask me, you know, how would you do this? How would you handle that situation? How do we fix this or that problem? So I'm hoping that I can cover some of that here in, in this uh, sort of crash beginner course for everybody today. And I want to start with uh, the, the first piece of advice I always give um, any beginner is when you get picked up for a job, whether it's a student film or an indie project or if it's something you're doing for a buddy, always, 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 if there is one, read the script. If you're doing interviews and stuff, it's obviously not really going to be a thing, but um, if there's a script, ask for it, read it. You don't have to memorize it. You're not an actor. You don't have to know everything that happens, but it's very, very important because let's face it, a lot of you guys are going to be mixer boom ops, right? You're going to be doing the one man band thing for probably for the, the start of your career, probably for a little while, maybe for years into it. It always depends on the budget you're working within. So it really helps, especially if you're going to be booming, to know the script, know what's happening in the story. And the reason for that is that even though there's not always action cues in the script, you might have to sit in on a, re on a rehearsal or something with the director to see what the blocking is going to look like, it really helps to know what's happening in the story and what kind of locations you're dealing with so you can plan ahead on what kind of gear you're going to need, um, plan ahead on how much mobility you're going to need. Like you can see today I brought my cart. Um, I love to bring my cart around uh, when I know that I'm going to be primarily stationary on something. It gives me something sturdy to set my bag up on. It gives me some place to store some extra equipment as needed. But um, when I am going to be on my feet a lot and moving around, I um, always make sure I have a nice harness with me that I can hang my bag on. It takes the strain off my back. I don't like neck harnesses, I don't uh, uh, neck um, straps. puts a little too much strain on the neck and the shoulders, and you're going to feel that after a long day. Uh, so. Know the script, know what you're dealing with. It's everybody's responsibility on set to know what it is that you're shooting. Um, and you know, unless you're like a PA or a grip where it really means absolutely nothing to you, you should know as much about the story and the action as the DP, as the director, as the gaffer, as anybody who's gonna be in control or interacting with any of the action that's happening. Uh, second thing I, I wanna always stress to people is dress code. Now, sometimes you'll be working on indie films, sometimes you'd be working on corporate, you know, talking head videos, and always dress appropriately. There are only a few roles on set where you can get away with wearing cargo shorts and looking, you know, borderline sloppy, and that's, you know, if you're grips and, and people like that who are going to be doing a lot of running around, lift, heavy lifting, maybe they're in and out of, you know, hot locations, you know, under the lights, in and out of trucks, in and out of a building all day, that's one thing, but the sound mixer along with the DP and the director, are typically front and center, or as much as, we, as much as we would be compared to the rest of the crew. So you don't want to be dressed distractingly. You, you want to, you know, if, if you're supposed to be blending into the background, wear dark clothes. Um, if you're dealing with corporate work, dress semi-corporate. You know, be comfortable, and, and especially if you do have to run around with the boom a little bit, make sure that you have mobility in your arms and stuff to get around, you know, your legs. You're not wearing anything too restrictive. But you know, I've done a lot of corporate sit-down stuff, and I try to always show up looking like the CEOs, or at least as close as I can. Um, people tend to get along with and respect. People in power tend to get along with and respect people who look and act like them. So you can create uh, instant rapport with somebody if you just kind of show up looking the part. Uh, so that's that's always a big one. And show up early. I don't care what your call sheet says. I don't care if it says that the rest of the crew gets there at 8 a.m. and you don't have to show up till 10. They love doing that to sound people. They say, oh, they just got to throw on their bag and plug in the boom and go. But as you're going to see uh, over the next hour or so, it's not quite that simple. It can be. But if you really want to get the high quality audio recordings, uh, you're going to want to get there early because you're going to want to scope out what things are looking like, what the set looks like. Again, know a little bit about the script, know what's going on, what moving parts are going where. So just you know, get there early enough to get yourself set up and still have some time to ask appropriate questions, figure out what's going on. Um, outside of that, we're going to dive into a little bit of what goes into a, a very basic audio kit. These are, these are pretty much the bare minimums that you're going to need, and I'm going to show you a couple of other little extras that you can have on hand, make your life a little bit easier. But first and foremost, you need a good solid mixer. 
Now, if you're at the level where you're still using something like an H4N, um, you know, I, uh, to be completely honest, I wouldn't recommend starting off with that, only because there's nothing wrong necessarily with the quality of it, but uh, those don't have any kind of fluid controls over, over the volume, right? So those have the, that has the little rocker switches on the side that, and you're gonna actually hear the volume increase in increments. So if you're trying to change the mix level on something while someone's speaking, which you really shouldn't do, but sometimes you have to, right? Let's, let's face it, sometimes you have to. Um, you're not gonna to wanna to hear that clicking incremental volume shift as you're going. So uh, I really recommend if you're gonna start on the lower end like that, start with something like an H5 and H6. Those have actual dials on them. It'd be a little bit of a smoother transition between levels. I'm currently running the F8N. Um, I really like it. It's, it's in line with the Sound Devices Mix Pre-Line. I kinda like this a little bit better. It's, uh, it's, got, it's made of more metal, it has more heft to it, it feels more durable. I like the interface better, the user interface. The menu system just feels more intuitive to me. I've, I've used the Mix Pre's a handful of times. They're just not for me. Nothing wrong with them if that's what you have available or if that's what you like using. Use what you know. Um, you know. Ultimately, the quality that you get out of your production is how well you know your gear. All right, some of it's the gear, some of it's the operator, but if the operator knows their gear, you have a good combination. Um, so from there, mixer, um, a, a good boom pole. I'm using a, a K-Tech Avalon. It's an internally wired pole. So you actually plug your XLR right here on the end. There's a coiled cable inside, comes out the top, connects. And with this, you don't have to worry about wrapping the cable around and um, a lot of the snags that happen over the course of a day, you know, if you're doing a lot of work, I've been on sets where I've had to actually extend and retract the pole in real time because of obstacles in the way of my mobility. Uh, so having this internally wired stopped me from snagging the wire, yanking the microphone back, like I almost just did with my thumb. Um, it just kind of helps keep things you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a good position. And you're not gonna get that slapping that you occasionally get when the, if the wire comes loose and starts hitting the pole. Um, there is, there can be some handling noise here if you're not careful with it. But again, you know, it's, it's all about practice. The more familiar you are with the gear and the limitations and how you can move, when you should move, how to do it. Um, you know, it's something that you'll develop over time and you'll, you'll, be, you'll be pretty good about it uh, overall. Um, a solid shotgun mic. I'm using the NTG3 from Rode. Uh, I upgraded to this uh, about a year ago. I was using the NTG, NTG2. Uh, one model lower, drastic difference in quality. Um, the NTG2 broke, I tried fixing it, that was a disaster, threw it out, bought this. Um, you do what you have to do. In terms of wireless lavaliers, um, there are a lot of brands on the market now. There are a lot of brands that are a little bit more affordable. To be completely honest, I personally haven't liked or trusted anything any, any lower than the Sennheiser G series. So I started off, I have two G3s and I have one G4 pair. Um, they're great to start with. They come loaded with features that are gonna work really well for a variety of situations. And you know the ability to control the frequency ranges and, and the channel banks and stuff is really great as opposed to some of the earlier road wireless and some of the some of the more no-name stuff that's out there on the market, um, they're just not so helpful if you run into a snag. And I have run into several, and the ability to kind of move through the menus and change what frequencies we're on in a pinch has saved my life on many a production. Um, and that's essentially, that's essentially a basic kit. When someone says they're looking for a mixer with a basic kit, it's a mixer, a boom, shotgun, and typically two lobs in a basic kit. I carry a third with me in case production needs it, or sometimes we'll send a, a wireless feed out of my bag over to a camera if they don't have a uh, reference mic on the camera. Some of the older Reds and you know stuff like that, they don't have mics on them at all. Uh, and some cameras just have very poor mics that won't pick up on everything. Uh, so I like to send, whenever I can, send a feed right out of the bag to the camera for scratch audio. Uh, in fact, what I'm doing here today is I'm actually live mixing myself. Um, I'm actually going into my own bag here and I'm sending a wire out to the Strix Media uh, Video Village table back there, way, way over there, guys. Good. <laughs> Barely see you. Um, so on top of that, uh, 
there's one there's one item that people argue about a lot, okay? And that is the slate or the clapper. Now, you probably all know what this is. I'm going to show you anyway. This guy right here. A lot of people think this is camera department, and it can be. If you're talking about a dummy slate like this one, where it's just clapper, whiteboard, camera department can have one, should have one. Everybody should have one. Directors should have one because someone always forgets to bring theirs. So it's good to have one in your trunk or in your kit nearby. Um, technically though, because it involves sync and syncing sound to picture, it is technically a camera, uh, sorry, a sound department item. So I've got this dummy slate. Awesome. Um, I've had it for a few years, as you can tell, screws are falling out. Uh, <laughs> so this is one option, super cheap. I think this was like 15 bucks on Amazon. You can, you know, there's a variety of them out there. You can get them with color bars on them if you want. Um, your, your colorist will thank you if you happen to have that. Uh, there are also smart slates, which then we start getting into time code, time code signal out of the, out of the bag, syncing to camera, syncing time code to the, to the slate. When you clap it, it freezes momentarily on, on the time code so that in post, the editor can line everything up a little bit better. Um, that's not necessarily a 101 level thing though, so we're not really gonna get into smart slates today. But just know that uh, if you wanna build out a solid kit that your director is gonna thank you for bringing, make sure that you have a dummy slate in your sound kit. Yes, I want to just let everyone know that um, if they want to ask some questions in the chat, we'll get to them at the end. Yes, um, for anyone who is new here, uh, if you're watching live, um, if you're watching on Facebook or the Eventbrite event, uh, you can ask questions in the chat or on Facebook, and we will periodically check in and see what questions you have, or maybe we'll save some for the end for Q&A. Don't ask anything stupid. I don't feel like answering stupid questions. All right, just don't. So, um, in addition to the slate, a couple of other things that I recommend bringing along uh, are a, a few extra microphones. Now, these are things that production may not necessarily ask you to have, and if they do, you know, technically it's an upcharge, but I like to have them with me because I never know what I'm gonna walk into. Sometimes people plan poorly, sometimes the room doesn't, isn't necessarily conducive to what we need to do. Uh, some locations are just hostile to sound, so having gear options is never a bad thing, and if you don't use them, at least you had them, right? So I always like to bring a set of cardioid mics that will fit onto my boom pole. And because this is a beginner sort of 101 thing, these are very inexpensive. I believe you can get the, the stereo pair. These are Samson CO2s. You can get them for like 115 bucks or something like that for, for two mics. Um, they're a cardioid pickup pattern, electric condenser, uh, small, small condenser. And um, the thing with shotguns is that their pickup pattern is so narrow. And that's great if you're trying to avoid you know, a lot of the reverb in the room, if you're, trying, if you're in a semi-noisy location, like a park, outdoors or something, um, and there's a moderate amount of noise, the, 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 the way that shotgun mics are built is gonna help reduce some of that. But maybe you're in a place where it's not too noisy and you actually might want some of that room tone, you might want some of that, uh, some of that natural reverb from the space. So if you're doing something uh, like, like a narrative film, uh, you know, a, 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 like an indie short or something like that, which a lot of people are probably working on, especially right now, um, you might want some of that room noise. Um, so this is gonna help. This is gonna pick up some of that room noise uh, while still giving a more natural sound. The other thing I like about this is that because the pickup pattern on a cardioid, and if anybody's not familiar, um, cardioid, it's, it's sort of shaped like a heart, right? So out of this, you'd have sort of a bubble that comes out of either side. So it has, picks up a little on the side and you know, primarily in the front, but a wider range than say this, which is gonna be very, very narrow. So a lot more like a telephoto lens, right? It's gonna cut out a lot of the stuff on the sides. Now, if you have a, I've had this, I've encountered this, if you don't have enough wireless for say four people at a, you know, sitting at a board meeting, um, the shotgun might not be conducive because you might not be able to move it around quickly enough and aim it at every person when they have their lines. You might have somebody on, on either far end exchanging lines and you just can't shift around quick enough. And if you don't have enough wireless for them, that's gonna be a problem. So what you do is you get one, one or two of these, depending on how big the setup is, and you drop it right up overhead. And you're, it's less of a risk that they're gonna fall off axis of the microphone pickup, which is very, very common with, uh, with shotguns. We have a question from Joseph Metz. He says, can you explain what you mean by hostile sound? So uh, Joe, is it? Joe wants to know what I mean by 
hostile sound, uh, locations being hostile to sound. The perfect example of a location being hostile to sound. I was hired to sh come down and shoot a pickup day on a short film. The producer rented, it was on a Sunday morning, they rented the uh, sort of back courtyard area of a bar in Manhattan. Uh, and you would think on a Sunday morning, right? This was pre-COVID, this is a couple years ago now. Uh, you'd think, you know, Manhattan on a Sunday is generally quiet, not a whole lot of rush hour noise going on, right? That's what I thought. Well, I showed up and the courtyard was gorgeous, beautiful location, except two skyscrapers on either side of us had construction crews working the entire day. That's an example of a location being hostile to sound because there is absolutely nothing you're going to do about it. You can bring all the sound blankets in the world. You're not blocking that out. Uh, so in a case like that, it's not necessarily a mic choice, although working with something like a shotgun that is going to reduce some of that background noise helps minimally at, better than nothing. Um, we essentially just made a longer day out of it because we had to wait for lunch breaks. We had to wait for the jackhammers to stop before the welders started and, you know, all the, all the different noise that happened. So some locations are like that. Um, you might be, you might be doing a talking head interview for some pharmaceutical company and their executive office suite is right off a highway. And maybe they're facing the highway. And the entire time, this doctor's talking about, you know, whatever, you know, new technology they've discovered. Um, you've got trucks going by outside because it's 1 p.m. and they're all done with their lunch break and they got to get their loads where they're going. So there are times that you can't do anything, essentially, about the environments that you're in. So that's why it helps to have just a little bit of extra prep, a little, few extra things in your toolbox that may or may not act as you know, somewhat successful band-aids to tricky situations. Um, another one that I really like, and the quality is sometimes iffy on these, and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna go a little more in depth with this in a moment, but this here is a boundary mic. And this is not the most expensive boundary mic. I literally needed something in a hurry and I bought, I think, what was like the second cheapest one available at the time because I didn't want to drop a lot of money on something that I might only need once. But these are nice because you actually just put these down on a surface. Like I would just drop that there. And it uses some of the reverberation from the surface that it's on uh, to amplify the sound in the room and then pump it through the actual mic sensor inside there. Um, and that's great if you don't know if you're going to be able to get microphones into every spot that you need. You'll see a lot of these at like board meetings and uh, even like when you see some politicians speaking, like if they're at a big table, you'll see like you see a lot with world leaders. They'll have a bunch of these laid out on the table. They'll usually hook them up to like speakerphone systems and, you know, conference calls and stuff like that. But you can absolutely send this to a sound mix bag. Um, and it's just an extra option just in case, you know, look. Electronics have days, just like we have days, right? You have one of those days where stuff's just not going right. Like, it happens. Um, so, again, just another option to have. I think I spent 100 bucks, maybe 150 on this, and I've used it just a handful of times. But the times that I've needed it, it saved my butt because for whatever reason, you know, I was getting a lot of wireless interference or, you know, for some, like somebody knocked my, my mic and it just didn't sound good for the rest of the day. I had, a, you know, maybe do some service on it. So this helps absolutely to um, just act as an extra backup and it doesn't cost you anything to bring it around with you. It's very compact. I throw it in one of those little K-Tech bags I have over there. I keep one of those little small mixers for my, uh, for my F-Series and this just sits right on top of the foam on top of it. It takes up almost no space. But we will get into uh, plant mics a little later when we get to some, uh, some lavalier techniques. So we're gonna come back to this. Quick question. Question. Um, do you have the suggestion for type of uh, cardioid mic? Like that's not like affordable if you were to get something a little bit more mid-level? Um, you know, to be completely honest, I feel like that's, uh, sorry, so the question was if I have a suggestion on a, on, a, on a cardioid mic that isn't necessarily a budget item. To be completely honest, um, I actually like the sound that comes out of these and I haven't really bothered looking into other models. And I will say, I know Sennheiser makes a lot of really nice ones, but I will also tell you that everything with Sennheiser is a number. For this, 500, that, 600. Uh, to be completely, perfectly honest, I don't have the numbers memorized. So I don't know, essentially, but um, just know that, you know, if you want to have some extra coverage, look into some cardioid uh, mics, something that will, you know, they usually will come with some kind of mount that'll go onto a boom pole. Um, 
and you know, just really buy with, with whatever's within your budget. You know, whatever you feel is important enough to spend on something like that. I would be completely misleading you if I threw a model name out right now. Just full disclosure. So aside from that, so we went over shotgun, cardioid, plant mics. Um, I want to talk a little bit about boom technique because I've seen some videos and Dan here at Strix has even told me he saw a video where someone said point the microphone at their chest. I was going to let, just let that sink in for a moment. Point the microphone at their chest. You ever seen a singer recording an album? Do they ever point the microphone at their chest or do they, they put it right here and sing into it? So best practice is always to have the microphone just out of frame. You want it as close as possible. And that can be tricky. And I'm going to talk about that as well. One of the, one of the important things as a sound mixer, as a boom up, is to know your frame sizes. You have to get a little familiar with the cameras and the lenses and the stuff that, you know, the camera team is using. And it never hurts to just ask, hey, hey you know, am I, uh, am I in frame? Am I out? Let me know when I'm out. You know, if you're doing a sit down interview, you might throw the boom uh, on, on a boom cradle like this one. And at that point, it's usually just kind of a set it and forget it, right? Once they lock the frame off, you get the boom up in place and you're good to go. But if you're, if you're hand booming and you're, you know, you're moving in and out, um, you know, have them, have them shout out at you, you know, run a, run a boom rehearsal if you can right before they, they go and actually, and actually start recording. So you can see where your frame lines are. And over time, you're going to get familiar with it. Like, oh, what's that? Uh, that's a 55. All right. I know that for a 55, I need to be, you know, about yay high because you're about this far away. Um, that's just something that you learn. That's an instinct that you pick up over time. Um, I've gotten decent at it, but you know, we all make mistakes. What I, what I used to do occasionally was take a really thin piece of, uh, of some colored tape and just put a real thin strip of tape around here. That way, if you're setting up, especially for sit downs, if there's a dark background and uh, you, you don't even need the camera team to shout at you, if you, as long as you're within view of the monitor, you can lower the mic at the place and you can see the tape if it's breaking the frame line or not. And if once you see it break the frame line, just lift it back up a little bit and you're, and you're typically pretty good. Um, and with that, that reminds me as well. So don't always expect that um, the grip department's going to have stands and stuff for you. So I have this Kupo baby stand, which I really like. Um, I keep it with a grip head here and a boom cradle in my kit at all times. I carry around in a duffel bag. It packs up with my, with my boom pole. Um, I throw some sound blankets in there just to keep everything padded and separated, and, and we're good. And the, the beautiful part about this is that, again, if you're, if you're setting up for something, and I'm not going to actually hook this up to the wire now, but, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this before, but I'm just going to do it real quick. So if you're setting up for something, and, and you know what, uh, Nico, why don't you grab that chair and bring it over? No, for you. So for a sit down, yep, you're good. You're going to want to just kind of walk around the subject and, and see that you're about centered with them. And you may need to readjust this over time. Sometimes the interviewer comes in and sits in a spot completely different from where you thought they were going to be, and so their 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 you know eye line is going to change. But let's just say you're going to stay there looking at that laptop. So right about here is, is about centered enough for me for the direction he's looking at. And it might be a little different from the way the camera's seeing it. And then we're going to want to just drop this in. And obviously, we're not running a tight frame on this, so it's a little hard to say. But you want to be about here. And ideally, you want the tip of the mic to be about two feet, not too much more than two feet from their lips. That's just kind of the ideal sweet spot. That's where it's going to get the best signal um, without capturing too much of the room tone, without having to pump the gain up too high and then bringing that noise floor up. Um, and actually, you know what? Turn the chair and face me. And just to demonstrate that, um, turn it a little bit more this way. So once I get it lined up here, I'm just going to drop it in. And now I'm just making assumptions here. I'm just assuming that for whatever job this is, the DP is telling me, OK, you're out of frame. So this would be you know, a pretty ideal position. And actually, I'd angle it down just a little bit more. 
It doesn't have to be super precise. If it's, you know, aiming at his glasses a little bit or at his tie, it's okay. Just uh, don't do whatever that video Dan said he saw was where they're like, yeah, that's great. You're, he's gonna sound awesome that way. It's not, it's not gonna sound great at all. So wanted to touch on that. Um, so actually, go ahead, don't you stand up real quick. So one of the other things you're gonna wanna do is when you're, when you're working with one of these is if you know that you're gonna be moving around a lot, practice your walking. And that sounds ridiculous, right? Because like we've all probably been doing it our whole lives, right? But practice walking quietly and, uh, and, and learn how to be a little nimble. Keep your knees bent, right? Don't lock any of your joints. And if you, why don't you step over here? And so if I had to walk with him, and I'm, we're not gonna go too far because I don't wanna you know, completely ruin the frame or the focus here, but if you were just, just kind of step forward and back a little bit, if I knew that I had to walk with him, just go ahead, front and back. Face, face that way? Yeah, just like that. All right, now just, just take a few steps in every, every, you know, which way. So I'm just gonna follow him, right? Now again, assuming I'm out of frame, just, we're just making the assumption that I'm fully deployed in the pole and I'm further away. I just wanna follow him. And notice I'm not taking any hard steps. I'm not planting my body down. I'm kind of trying to move fluidly here. If I have to kind of, you know, cross my legs over, it gives me a little bit of cushion as I go. All right, that's good. Um, and that's, that's something I see a lot of beginners. They, they plant themselves firmly because they think, man, I need all this, this strength to hold this thing. And, you know, you have, to, you have to be like bamboo, right? You have to be flexible, be firm but flexible. So make sure that you can move a little bit. Um, another thing I see that I'm, I'm guilty of this, and I'm going to show you, and it's not a good idea. I've only done it when I've absolutely had to. But I see a lot of boom ops, new boom ops doing this hanging it over their shoulder like this. Now, on an indoor shoot with just a little foam on the end of the mic, it's probably not too heavy. But if I stand here for 20 minutes doing a take because somebody can't get one word right and they have to keep redoing it, redoing it, redoing it, um, this is gonna get heavy after a while. And this is gonna, you know, this is gonna start to really press down on my neck. Now remember what I said before about wearing a good harness that takes the pressure off your neck, puts it on your shoulders and back. Well, you're, you're undoing whatever good you're doing with a, with a solid harness by putting this pole on your back. So this works. You can, you can tuck one elbow in and you can kind of tuck this way and tuck this elbow in this way and hold it up like that if you're not going to go for a full overhead. And you can kind of just, then you're just kind of resting your arms into your own body. And that's going to be a little bit more comfortable. And you still have the ability to move, right? So general rule is you use the front hand to point and use the back hand to steer right, like an oar. So whichever way they go, if they're, if they're moving around, if you have to come up over obstacles, um, you know, you have the ability to kind of do that. If you're gonna go for the old classic fully deployed and, you know, full, you know, uh, field goal position, um, just know that you're gonna get tired. This works, this works well, sometimes you have to do it. Um, I've done stuff where I've had to boom on the other side of a car from somebody and walk with them. There was no way I was gonna get away with doing this. I'd be scratching the cars up. So I had to walk around a parking lot like this and, you know, decently long enough take and out in the hot sun after a while it does start to get a little taxing. Um, but good posture is important, good form. Um, you're going to be standing all day. It's going to get hard. It's going to get, you're going to get tired. So just be mindful of your, of your posture and your positioning and you should be pretty good. Now, um, from here, I want to I want to start going into lavaliers because this is actually going to take uh, a little bit longer, I think, to, to touch on some of the stuff we want to do here. Uh, but those are some of your basic boom approaches. Uh, do we have a question, guys? Yep. Cool. Uh, Alex was wondering, what is the least noisiest input into an external recorder? Three point five, quarter inch, or XLR? So the least noisy input into a recorder, uh, three and a half millimeter, quarter inch, or XLR. XLR typically is going to be your most professional connection. They're going to be balanced, typically balanced. Uh, so you're not going to get a lot of you're not going to get a lot of interference on those. But um, there are several things in you know down, that go down the pipeline uh, that contribute to noise. So your your quarter inch can sometimes be balanced, sometimes not. And your, your, your three and a half millimeter uh, typically is unbalanced and you do run the risk of a little bit more inherent noise in the wire itself. 
But you have to keep in mind, the, the amount of noise that hits your recorder involves a lot of things. It involves the connection at your input device, so your microphone. It involves the circuitry in the microphone, how good it is, how well maintained it's been, if you've been keeping it you know, in, in good shape, if you bang it or if you try to hammer nails with this you know, to hang up a picture frame, it, it's gonna sound noisy next time you go on set. Uh, so don't do that. But um, the, the, the condition of your wire, the age of your cables and stuff are gonna contribute to noise and then straight into the actual preamps that you're, that you're running into on your recorder, the, the, the sort of um, tier that your recorder is on, the level that, that, you're, that you're working on. So there's a few things there that are gonna determine how much noise you get. Um, and there's always, always, always gonna be some nominal amount of noise floor, even in the most expensive gear. And um, that's actually something that I, I didn't touch on yet, but one thing I do wanna mention is uh, some people get pretty confused about levels, right? When you're mixing and you're looking down at the mixer and, oh, well, I see, you know, it's, it's not hitting the red, so it must be fine. I've gotten, since I do a lot of post-production work, I've gotten a lot of student films, especially where, you know, inexperienced mixers and boom ops, it's not their fault. It's something they have to learn over time, but they will, uh, they will record sometimes a little too low, right? So I'll get something that's averaging out at about like minus 30. And that's really hard then to bring it up to a, a clean sounding, you know, average of minus 22 if you're going to go for a broadcast standard or if you're going for like a podcast you're talking about somewhere around minus 18. So the the louder you try to pump that initially low signal the more of the of the noise floor you're bringing up and that's noise floor across all of the components that lead from the subject to the mixer itself. So I try to typically keep my peaks somewhere between minus 12 and minus 6. I like what I'm saying is I like to mix a little hot um, because I don't want to run into the problem of, you know, somebody might be really excited to have a really a loud line that they're delivering for one specific portion and then they start to get quieter or maybe their confidence starts to go down. You know, after a couple of takes, uh, being told they're not quite doing it right, they might start to get a little subconscious and start talking a little softer. And I'm always making sure to keep an eye on my meters and, and ride my trim and my faders as necessary. But Sometimes it gets away from you. Sometimes you're just not picking up on the fact that it's kind of, you know, they're getting a little quieter. So I like to mix max minus six, and I do throw a very subtle limiter on my bag, um, like around minus two, just to stop it from peaking that little bit if they were to shout, you know, if they had a really loud line somewhere. You guys all right over there? Move the, open the screen. No questions? Okay. So... The subject of, uh, of, of wiring up a, uh, a talent with a microphone can be a little touchy sometimes. And especially, you know, especially these days, you can't be too sure that someone's completely comfortable with what, you're, what you need to do to complete your job. Um, I'm personally not a fan of touching strangers. I've never been. And so that makes this, part, this aspect of my job a little bit trickier. But I've found ways of kind of getting around it, dealing with it. And I feel that it, it helps me keep things um, even a little bit more professional than some of the competition, again, depending who we're talking about. Uh, so one of, the, one of the main things that we do, uh, that I try to do, is create a, some rapport, create a level of comfort with the subject beforehand. Because remember, you might be working with seasoned actors, you might be working with people who've been on camera dozens of times, or you might be working with you know, a, a new CEO who's only done a couple of interviews, doesn't exactly know what's gonna happen, maybe doesn't, maybe they're a little germophobic or something, they don't want people getting too close. Uh, or you know, I've been in situations where I'm doing documentary work and I'm miking people who've never had a mic on before. They might even be, I had one person who was actually nervous about the microphone, she happened to be pregnant, she was worried that there might be some kind of radiation running through the wire and she was worried it might do something to her baby. And, if they don't understand the equipment, then those are all valid concerns. You know, it's easy, to, it's easy to kind of shrug it off or laugh at it even because it sounds ridiculous to people like us who know what we're working with, but to someone who has no idea what you do for a living or the, the sort of the, the different elements of it, this is kind of an intimidating thing. So, um, this is Nico. I'm gonna just turn his mic on real quick. Nico, say hi to everybody. Hello. Heard that, cool. Uh, 
So I have him mic'd already, um, and we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of deconstruct the way I have him mic'd. But before I get to that, I want to talk about how I approach somebody for the first time. If I've never worked with them, um, if they look like they might be a little intimidated about the process, you know, they they, they walk onto set for the first time, they see these lights and cameras, and they look a little overwhelmed. Just try to make them comfortable, right? Like it's not. This is not. Contrary to popular belief, because there's a lot of people that make jokes about sound guys being creeps and pervs and stuff. Contrary to that, a lot of us, we are we are just as uncomfortable as you guys are, as the talent is. Um, it's not an enjoyable experience having to get up in somebody's personal space. And to be completely honest, because of COVID now, I have almost completely eliminated miking people with body mics uh, for like the last year and change because it's ju it just hasn't been necessary. To be, to be perfectly honest, the boom is almost always going to be your best sounding uh, audio source. Uh, body mics are typically sort of a, a backup, unless of course you're talking about a super wide angle where you can't get the boom in, and then you have you, you have to rely on the wires, right? Uh, but this is this is something that you know people think they can rely on the lobs, and and I really I don't recommend that. And we're gonna I'm gonna show you exactly why that is in a few minutes. But back to this. So if if you know, Nico here is his family. He knows me, so he's comfortable with me. But let's say he was a complete stranger. He has no idea who I am. He's never done this before. One thing you always walk up, you know, introduce yourself. Hi, hi, I'm Rob. I'm hi, the sound how mixer. are you? Good. I'm the sound mixer today. Um, we're going to get you mic'd up in just a moment for camera. Okay. Are you comfortable with that? Yes. Okay, so he said yes. Some people will say yes reluctantly. If you sense that, you have to work on that. One thing that I don't like to do either is when I... I like to explain what I'm doing, right? So I like to say, so, okay, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to put a mic on you. Um, you know, we're going to put it like sort of like this one right here that I'm wearing. Only it's going okay. to be under your clothing so that we're not, uh, you know, we don't see it on camera. We're going to hide it. And I'm just going to run a wire around and we're going we're gonna to place a, a belt pack on the back of your pants. Okay. Is that, are you okay with yes, that? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, one thing that I've learned over the years is when you're explaining what you're going to do to somebody, to somebody else, what's really, really helpful is to be as l the least bit intimidating as possible. And one thing that's very intimidating is pointing, right? And we do this, we do this all the time. Like, hey, Dan, can you move that camera that way? You know, this, this light, the light's not going to get offended. But if I'm walking up to somebody who's nervous about doing this for the first time, and I start pointing, hey, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a mic right here, okay? And I'm going to run a wire, and I'm going to put a belt pack. To someone who's already nervous about this, that's going to make them very uncomfortable. Um, and this is purely just psychology, right? So what is a lot friendlier, a lot less threatening than the pointer finger is the thumb, right? Because thumb, thumbs up, right? I mean, I mean, this is a social media age. We all, everybody wants the thumbs up, right? Every, every time you post a photo, like, I don't know, um, I'm going live with Strix Media in 40 minutes, right? We all want those thumbs up, right? So you walk up to somebody and you, and you use your thumb and say, you might demonstrate on yourself first, or you might just point to them, but with the thumb, it's less intimidating. So what gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna put a mic on you, okay? Just like this one here, I'm going to put it right here. So on you, it's going to be right here, probably behind the tie or maybe up in the tie knot. Okay, and then it's going to run a wire under your shirt, and you can even help me with that if you want, so I don't have to, you know, put my hands on you. And we're going to run it around the back. I'm just going to connect it, and you can just put it in your back pocket or put it on your belt. Is that okay? Yes. Thumbs up. Um, so, uh, so th those those are those are the big ones, right? So you want to make sure you get their consent. You want to make sure that they're comfortable, and uh, in, in the case of maybe you're working with someone of the opposite sex or identifies as the opposite sex, um, things can get a little uncomfortable for, for everybody. Again, it's not necessarily the most thrilling experience for everyone. It's, it's quite awkward. Um, make sure you get their consent. Make sure if you absolutely if you can, make sure you have a, either a, a PA that identifies or is the same gender as them, or you have the director Essentially, don't do it alone. Don't ever put your hands on anybody. Don't ever start to do anything where you're fiddling with somebody's wardrobe where you might have to open a button or ask them to open a button. Don't start putting your hands on anybody unless you have a few witnesses around. And it's not that people are evil and they're going to try to accuse you of something, but there could be a misunderstanding. There, there could be a miscommunication. They might say yes to something, not fully understanding what you're about to do, and then they get nervous and they don't say anything until a week later, and now there isn't anybody around to help back you up. So you, you wanna make sure that you cover yourself, make sure that you're in a safe position to do your job effectively, safely, and comfortably, and that everybody else is comfortable without having to worry about 
you know, someone someone getting the wrong idea of what you're doing, saying you got a little touchy feely. It's absolutely not necessary, and it's completely avoidable in most cases if you just kind of think this through ahead of time. I have a question. Yeah. And it's a little bit of uh, off topic, but sure. um, when you're micing someone up and you're running the wire through their clothing, uh, I've seen you know different people do it different ways. Some people say that the less that the wire can move the less feedback you'll ever get from it. Do you ever like apply gaff tape uh, to like the inside of someone's jacket so it's not kind of like free hanging or? When you say feedback, do you mean? you mean Like from like the, just the like wire touching stuff? things, not necessarily the mic, but the, the wire, the wire itself. itself. Okay, so Dan's question was about when you, when you mic somebody and you're running the mic under their clothing, I just tap the mic like I always tell people not to do. Um, <laughs> I knew that was gonna happen at least once. Uh, how do you how do you go about reducing cable noise? And I'm actually gonna we're gonna we're gonna touch on that. Okay. So I'm I'm gonna just gonna hold on to that. I'm gonna come back to Perfect. it. Perfect. I just didn't want to forget. So no problem. Nico's mic is just a touch hot. Um, sure. A little bit Nico, count to ten. One, two, three, four. Good. Good. Awesome. So from so why don't we from here? All right. So we covered you know getting consent, getting level of comfort, a, a rapport with the talent. Um, Let's just go ahead and start talking about miking. So I, as I mentioned, I pre-miked him because we have a specific situation that I wanted to uh, sort of address here and show people that I don't normally do this when I do it in person. Um, I've, I've given this presentation to schools and stuff before and I don't normally do this because it takes a little bit more time than some of the other, um, some of the other techniques and I didn't want to be wasting time fumbling around with tape on camera. But as you can see, Nico's wearing glasses. And right now, his microphone is actually hidden in his glasses. And for the, for the distance that we're, that we're kind of at right now with the camera, I'm, I'm sure nobody's really picked up on it aside from maybe the wire hanging out and maybe this sort of sloppy tape job I did to hide it back here. Um, and that's really just because we did it in a hurry to kind of get it tested and get it ready for the, for the stream here. But hiding in the glasses is a great option if for some reason their wardrobe isn't conducive to hiding the mic on them. So you may be dealing with somebody with very short hair. Maybe you're dealing with a uh, you know, female talent with short hair and, and like a low cut top or something. And there's nowhere that you can really hide the mic close, you know, to their mouth. So you get the optimal pickup. So he's wearing glasses. If the talent was wearing glasses, this is an approach we can use. Now, as you can see, turn this way, you can see the, um, the arm of his glasses is, is of, a, of a pretty moderate thickness, which helps because you know it helps to hide the wire and helps to hide some of the tape job that I did here. So if you just won't mind just taking that off, I'm gonna yep. just take this tape off. And if we can just get a close up on, on these glasses. So what I did was, you know, let me just undo this here. So what we did here was we took a little bit of top stick double-sided tape, and I'm gonna go over what I have in my, in my mic kit soon. Um, and I just put a layer of double-sided tape on the arm of the glasses on the inside, placed the mic in, and then overlapped another piece of tape on top of it to keep it concealed. And I just did that to run the wire all the way down the glasses here. Now, if you were dealing with like a sit-down interview or something, this would also be a good option. Um, if you're doing like a really tight shot and maybe again, for some reason you just couldn't get them mic'd properly, uh, or maybe you're in a hurry or something, this would work really well as long as the arm that the, is concealing the mic is facing the camera and not, not away from camera. Um, you'll be able to hide that relatively well. Now the mics that I'm using for this are Sankin COS 11 Ds. These are generally smaller, uh, capsule sizes than the stuff that's going to come stock with your Sennheiser. Uh, G3, G4s, which typically are these guys. These are a little bit larger. They're a little bit harder to hide, um, which hence I'm not hiding mine right now. It's just out there. Uh, but the, the Sankin mics are very good to hide. There are some other brands that are smaller and easier to hide as well. There's DPA. There's, uh, there's a few, uh, few products from Countryman that are really good at, at being hidden. These are very small. Um, this is what I keep in my kit. They're sort of the industry standard at the level that I'm at, and that's, that's what I've got with me, and it works in this particular application. So while we're, uh, I'm gonna just kind of take this off now so I can discuss some of the other things. Are there, have there any questions coming in that I can? Um, I, have a, I, I just have a real question. Any just real quick tips on hiding rustling from labs? So, so quick tips on hiding rustling from labs. It's, 
I'm glad you asked that because that's what we're doing next. Um, Lavalier Russell is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem almost everywhere. There, and there are a lot of companies that sell all kinds of mic mounts and things that help reduce it. Um, to a certain degree, it's something that you're always going to deal with. Every, every situation is going to be a little bit different. Um, some of it just simply depends on talent movement, what they're doing, if they're, if they're moving around a lot in their seat, or um, what kind of material their clothes are made out of. Uh, we tested some of these methods uh, last week and found that some of his clothing is excessively noisy just by nature. And I actually figured that would be a better, it'd be better to demonstrate with noisier clothes than quieter clothes because um, if you can make it work even to a, you know, an acceptable level with noisier stuff, then you can apply the same techniques to quieter clothes and you'd be fine. Um, cotton generally is nice and quiet, but when you start getting into blended fabrics and stuff, these tend to be a little bit noisier. So, I want you to go ahead and put on that coat that you brought. So let's talk about um, let's talk about miking a coat, right? So a, co a coat, a winter coat, is definitely a, a noisy material, right? I mean, you put those things on, and while you're putting them on your shoulders, you almost can't hear anything because they're just rustling on their own. A microphone is absolutely going to pick up some of that, and there are a few ways that we can kind of mitigate that. So before we get too deep into this, this is my lav mounting kit. Um, I carry a, quite a few different things in here. So I've got some Ursa Foamies. I've got some right coat stickies with some right coat felt uh, to cover up um, you know, wind noise and stuff. I also carry some makeup sponges because I'm gonna show you guys how to make something similar to these Ursa Foamies out of a makeup sponge without having to spend so much money. Um, Double-sided tape, like I mentioned, this is this is top stick. This is the stuff that you typically use for um, like wigs and toupees and stuff like that. There, it's you buy like two boxes for like I don't know, not a lot of money, like ten bucks maybe at most uh, on Amazon. Uh, some some moleskin strips. So I buy I buy these in larger strips like this from the local drugstore. You'll find this where like their foot care stuff is. People use these on their feet if they have corns and things like that. They work really well for helping hide mics. Uh, a small pair of scissors, because you're going to have to have something to be able to cut your tapes with. This is uh, transport tape from 3M. Use this for bandaging wounds and stuff like that. It's super light. It's about a medium tack adhesive, so it goes on to most surfaces without a problem. Holds pretty well. It doesn't hurt when you pull it off a of skin. And the, the small pores in it not only help make it easier to rip, so you can, you can tear off a piece quickly when you need it, but um, it also breathes a little bit easier. So if you are putting the mic right to someone's chest or you know, sometimes I'll put it over here by the, by, the, by the neck if I absolutely have to, this will go on really easily and it'll allow the skin to breathe. It won't get, trap a whole lot of sweat underneath and then just turn your mics into a sweaty, yucky mess. Um, we've got some vampire clips here, which are basically very easy to hurt yourself with. They're basically small safety pins on a, on a plastic backer. And uh, these, these are great if you're dealing with like fluffier kind of materials like, um, like Sherpa or something like that. These will actually just stick in like pins right into the fabric and hold the mic in place there. Uh, some swiveling tie clips. Um, that's it. You know, uh, some, some bandages here. We'll go over what these bandages are for a little bit later because I'm going to show you the sort of brand name option and then what you can do with a $5 bandage from Walmart instead. So he's got this coat. Um, and as you, you can see, I mean, I'm just standing near it. You can probably hear it. Right? It's pretty noisy. So if I know that he's sitting down, it's less of a problem, right? I can, I can just stick, I could just stick it on somewhere with some tape and be done. But let's say he's, he's in a scene and he's walking around a little bit. So I know already it's going to be a little noisy. It's, it's, it's just going to happen. So that's actually the case where we might bust out one of these little vampire clips. Now, full disclosure, this is a vampire clip for a different mic, but I've had some success at using it with these Sanken mics. And since this is just a demonstration, we're just going to go ahead and try it. And if it sucks, then you know what not to do. 
Um, I like to always disconnect the transmitter before I mic somebody because I don't know where I'm going to be running the wire to. And so for this, we're just going to bend these, the tips of these, uh, these pins out just a little bit so that they'll catch the material. And we're just going to go right inside here, inside the, the coat. And just let me know if you can see that okay. Good there? Cool. So it's just going to sit right in there like that. We might need to put a windscreen on it. I might need to put something behind it to stop it from touching the jacket once we close the lapel. But let's just go ahead and see what we have. I could tell already it's, it's touching the shirt a little bit. Um, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to run this wire all around crazy places. And we're just going to just stick it in your pocket real quick. And now I'm just going to throw these on and see what we're getting. I can tell already it's a little noisy. As he's moving around, we hear it, we hear it rustling a little bit. Okay. So if you were to just count to 10 for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you can see, I mean, even though we hear some of the rustle, his voice is clear enough and loud enough, right? That if we absolutely had to fix it in post, and I'm only using that term because I fix it in post and I know what can and can't be done. Um, that is something that at that level, it's not too bad. But if you were to just start pacing a little bit, now we're gonna hear it a little bit more, right? Now it's picking up a lot more of that rubbing. So let's see what we can do about it. So the first thing I might try is I might just take one of these makeup sponges. I might just cut a little piece off of the wedge And we might just try applying it to the back of the mic really quickly, rather than actually putting it through and, you know, making an actual shock mount out of it, which we will get to. So, pull this open. Let me put this here. Let me just do a real quick tape job with some transport tape. And again, this is going to remove nice and easy when we're done without leaving too much residue on the mic. So we'll just close that up. Now, that might be a little bit better. Let's see. So you still hear a little bit of it, but it's definitely dampened a little bit. The sponge has helped to kind of absorb some of that, some of that motion. And there are some other additional things we could do, um, some other mounts we can use, but I'm just going to kind of go through this a little bit quicker. Why don't you just pace a little bit more? That's not as intense, right? It helps a little bit. Uh, we could we could put it in a few other places, but I want to get through the rest of the wardrobe. So that's just one option. You can put a vampire clip to the inside of the, the jacket like that. Uh, you could also you could also use these these right coat stickies. Now, this is a brand name item. You go on B and H or Sweetwater. Or, uh, Sweetwater may have it. Adorama does have it. Um, you can even get these on Amazon for pretty cheap. Um, I think I, I think I pay like 30 bucks for a hundred of them or something. But if that's out of your range, you can do something similar with a $5 roll of transport tape at your local CVS or something. And uh, I'm gonna show you both ways really quickly. So I'm gonna take this mic off. You can leave that. Leave it? Yeah. So with the right coat sticky, it's basically just a, a thin piece of foam with double-sided tape. So we go ahead and we take off the top layer. We stick the microphone right on there. We leave the top of the capsule out just a little bit. There are times where you'll actually bury the capsule down in the middle, but for this application, we're not doing that. So you're gonna keep the tip of the, of the capsule just outside of that. And then we go ahead and Take the backer off and apply this right to the inside here where we were with the vampire clip. And then, oh, for this, we could do another piece of foam. All right, you could just make another little, another little pillow here just to create some separation. And because this is double-sided tape here, this will just stick right to it. 
and place that down. Let's just see how that sounds. So it's still there, so I'm a complete liar, right? So what we'll do instead, I'm gonna cut the mic. Now, anybody who's ever made little footballs in school, little paper footballs, right, little triangles, you can do that with this tape. You're not gonna actually do any origami with it. You're just gonna take the sticky side out and you're gonna fold this down into a triangle. Now it's a little tacky to work with because it's the sticky sides out and just fold it down again and then fold it down again and then over and over again until you're done and you've got yourself a nice little football. Now some of the, some of the issue that we're getting here is just the inherent noise of the clothing which you're not gonna get rid of, the clothing is noisy, but where he's actually rubbing on the shirt with the mic, I'm gonna pull this foam off and we're gonna place a little bit of this tape right here, and we're gonna actually tape this down to the shirt. Now again, um, in a rush, I don't know exactly how this is gonna sound. Uh, on cer in certain situations, I would bust out a couple of other things. Let's just take a listen. So it's still there. Now do me a favor and count while you're walking. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. So we're generally getting a, still a good amount of noise from the jacket. At this point, to be completely honest, I would ask if there's a wardrobe department, I'd ask if they have any other options. I'd see if there's something else we could do. There are some options where we would actually just apply a whole lot of moleskin to the clothing itself on the inside to stop some of the rustling of the material. Uh, we would start getting creative with taping in different places. Some people will ask wardrobe, again, if there's a wardrobe department, if they can cut into the fabric and they'll actually run the, run the mics up through the inside of the jacket itself. Um, this is his jacket, he owns it. I'm not gonna start cutting it up on you. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna move on to the next thing. But just know that you have some options in cases like this and every, every jacket, every piece of wardrobe is gonna be a little bit differently. We just happened, thank you, to pick the noisiest thing he has in his closet for this. Um, the mic is cut. Let me get this. Let's take that jacket off. So the natural progression here is that now he's got a he's got a dress shirt on with a tie, right? So um, occasionally you might want to just run the mic right through the tie itself. And again, there are options. There are things you can go out and you can buy that will cradle the microphone a little bit and insulate it from the tie itself. Uh, those are great. They can get a little pricey, again, if you're on the beginner level and you don't have a lot of stuff available. Um, so if you have a small enough mic capsule, and to be completely honest, these, these, these little guys that come with the Sennheisers might actually still be small enough for this, depending on the, the tie and the knot, the type of knot that they use. So. If you don't mind just loosening, I'll do it for you. So I'm just gonna loosen the tie a little bit. I'm gonna flip the collar up. And we're gonna go in from the top of the tie and we're gonna come out the bottom right here where the dimple typically is in the tie where the, you know, where it stuff's up inside. So we're just gonna snake this in here. This works really, really well for um, Business, pe business type people, if you're doing some sit down interviews and corporate work and they're in a hurry and you don't have time to be messing with tapes and mounts and stuff. Most of them are wearing ties for their, you know, their on camera, you know, professional look. So you just ask them if they can loosen the tie real quick. You drop this down in the front and then we're just going to go ahead and just turn it this way. And we're just going to hide this underneath the, the rest of the tie going around the back. And at this point, if he were wearing something like a suit jacket, we would just go ahead and kind of, um, you know, bring that wire around the back here under the jacket, put it on the inside pocket. But since he's not wearing one, because I didn't tell him to, so it's fine, uh, we're just going to go with this method. And for this, again, this is, this is great for sit downs. If he's, if he's going to be sitting down, doing an interview with somebody and not moving around a lot, we've already tucked this in down here. I don't have to tape it around his shoulder. It's just hidden up here in the collar. And then we just go ahead and plug this in. And you know what, just hold it. 
we would typically go ahead and stick it on a belt or in a pocket. Um, but since we're going to be moving through setups quickly, we're not going to do that. So now he's live, um, or at least he should be. Can you count for me? One, two. Hold on. Let me see the pack. Make sure you don't do like I just did and hit the mute switch. Uh, so go ahead and count for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so you're hearing a little bit of this, right? You are hearing a little bit of the time material because he's moving his head a little bit. But now, uh, why don't you grab that chair or just go ahead and take a seat. So now he's sitting down. Let's say he's just doing a quick interview with somebody. You're going to be moving around very minimally. You're not going to hear a lot of it. And again, we're going to be, in most cases, we're going to be having our boom up overhead, capturing everything from, from here as well. So if you go ahead and count for me again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Nice and clean. He's coming in clear. Um, one thing I do note, uh, I don't know if anybody else is picking up on it, is that he is a, a tiny bit muffled. It's cutting a little bit of the high end, just a little bit too much. And that's something that's a very, very simple fix in post. It's not a fix it in post kind of thing where you're removing noise. It's just a very gentle EQ on the upper end. Um, and it looks like we have a question. Sorry, did you point the mic down? Yes. So the question was, did I point the mic down? Yes. Uh, most of the time, lavalier mics are omnidirectional. So they will pick up in a, in a wider circular pattern. Now, they do make cardioid pattern uh, mics and even some hypercardioid. They're a lot less common. They're, they're like specialty items. So unless you buy it specifically, you probably likely wouldn't have one just by default in your kit. Um, so what's nice about the uh, omnidirectional is that in, in this case, because we're pointing, we're pointing the mic down, it's able to pick up on it. Also, with it being in the tie and not too high up the throat, you're avoiding what we call the acoustic shadow of the chin. So even though when we speak, we're also omnidirectional, you know, our, our signal comes out in all directions, there are angles that it doesn't wrap around, right? So it's coming straight out. It's not going to wrap around the chin for most people. So, you know, having the mic a little bit lower allows it to pick it up, basically what would be like the outskirt of the, <laughs> of the signal, you know, the way that it kind of uh, emanates from his mouth. So stand right back up. So another question? Yeah, real quick question. Um, can you speak a little bit, just real fast, about um, room tone and uh, the purpose of room tone and also kind of using it to reduce noise in post? Sure. So the question was about room tone. Um, always get room tone. The room tone is basically the recording of the silence of the room that you're in. And there's never true silence, right? So right now we've got several lights. We have a laptop that's humming something crazy over there. Um, the cameras emanate their own pitch when they're running. Uh, so what happens is when a lot of people, when we get into post, we have noise to remove. And in removing the noise, you know, rustling and wind and even some, some background sounds that happen offset, uh, we end up taking out a lot of the room tone. And it makes the, it makes the dialogue sound very hollow and, and, and empty, right? It loses the characteristic of the room. And when you're, when you're sitting in person with somebody, I'm hearing my own reverb here. Like just as I'm speaking, it's, it's kind of just hitting me, you know, it, right through my ear, bouncing off the wall, and I'm hearing it. Um, when you get into post on something and you start removing some of that, it starts to feel very unnatural. And you'll be watching something back and you're seeing the space and it doesn't quite sound like their voice is coming from that same room anymore. So uh, we always try to get 30 to 60 seconds of clean room tone where nobody shuffles around, nobody clears their throat, nobody sneezes or talks. It's very hard to get. You have to start screaming at people to shut up and stop moving. But if you get it, uh, then you, you hand that over to your, to your editors uh, when they go to the post process, whether it's the picture editor, the sound editor, if they have a budget for that. Um, and once they remove the, the distracting clothing noises and other stuff from the recordings, they can go back then and put a layer of that pristine room tone back in underneath, and it builds back the frequencies that were taken out during the cleanup. Got it? Another question? Is it also good to get a room tone outside? So room tone outside. That's uh, what we would call external tone or earth tone. And the short answer is yes, always grab it. Uh, it's always good to have some silence from the place you're in for those purposes. It's a little bit trickier with exteriors, though, because, again, you might be near a busy road. Um, there might be 
might be air traffic, might be planes going through. Obviously, that's a little bit easier. You can try to time it out, wait till the plane goes, right? Um, but if you're near a road, that's a little bit trickier. You can't stop traffic. And you might not want to stop traffic because your dialogue tracks for your film might have the traffic in it, and it wouldn't be true when you go to put it back in. Uh, if you're someplace natural, like out in the woods or something like that, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, there are tricks, and um, I don't want to give away too much, but there are tricks to generating room tone after the fact, if you didn't have a chance to record it. It's a little trickier, requires a little more post knowledge, uh, and so I'm really not going to get into that here, but just know that there are some band-aids you can throw on later. But yeah, if you can, get it. The worst that happens is you get everybody to shut up for 30 seconds and you have like a half a minute of peace, right? Even if you can't use it, at least you have to get everybody to stop talking for a few minutes. So that's always a plus. So we have the tie, that works. The tie mount works pretty well. Um, again, there's some noise. There are some, some sort of like sleeves and caps you can put on the microphone body itself that kind of separates it from the material. That's gonna help a little bit. But again, we're doing more of a sort of 101 level, you know, you don't have a lot of stuff in your kit. You don't have a lot of options available and you maybe you don't have a lot of money to throw at it. So this will work in a pinch. It works decently well most of the time. Um, and you know, like I said, this is, this is where what I said earlier comes in really handy. Knowing the content, knowing either the script or just the kind of content that you're recording is gonna help you make those choices before you show up. You know, I, I've routinely uh, emailed producers and said, hey, do we know what talent's wearing? I wanna know what I need to bring. I wanna know if I have to, you know, maybe I'm running low on some of my supplies. I wanna know, do I need to order them right away overnight? Or, you know, can I wait till next week? Do I not need them right away? So keeping a good inventory on your stuff is just as important as keeping your batteries charged and you know communication with your crew and your producers and your directors is is one of the most important things before you show up on set as well as when you get there. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this mic out and I'm gonna show you what we would do with just a, a plain button down shirt. All right. yeah. You can go ahead and take the tie off. And Dan, feel free to jump in if there's any questions while we're these little in-between sections. I actually have a question. Another question? Uh, you said uh, before, like, what if uh, you're teaming someone who identifies as a female, but they have short hair and they have, like, a low-cut shirt. Where would you put that mic? That's where it gets a So the question was uh, the example I used before where if somebody has short hair and you can't hide it in their hair or on the side of their face and they're wearing, like, something revealing or low-cut and you can't really get it on the sternum or something, um, it really ultimately depends on what they are wearing. So one time I was doing it, I, we, we mic'd up, uh, it, was, it was an interview with a doctor and a host and the doctor was wearing like almost like workout clothes. She had like a, I don't know, like, like, a, like a tight like workout style top um, and it wasn't gonna work to kind of put it in any of the normal places. So our director was, was a woman and I said, hey, I need, your, I need a hand here. Um, I said, I'm gonna show you where to put it and you're gonna do it for me. And so I explained the whole thing. I prepped the mic in, in advance. So what I did was I used one of the right coat stickies, planted the mic on there. I put a little uh, piece of the, uh, the wind block felt on it, not because it was blocking any wind, it was indoors, but it was just gonna create a little bit of separation between the mic capsule and her, and her clothing. And because it was a, because it was a, you know, like a, I don't know what you would call it, not a halter, but whatever, it had straps. Uh, and they were thick enough straps. We were actually able to, I had the director run the strap uh, run it down the strap here, right here by the shoulder, not, not too far down, but you know, just enough that we could then run the wire around the back. And she was, it was seated. She was sitting on a couch, just threw the pack on the couch, told her, don't stand up in a hurry, you know, or you're going to yank the wire. And that was it. And it was fine. It sounded good. It hid well because she wasn't moving around. We didn't have to worry about Russell in that situation. If it was a walk and talk, that might be a little bit trickier, but again, we'd have the boom for something like that. And you know these these wires are really backups to when the boom doesn't get what it needs to. Um, so, and and if you ever get into audio post work and you start to understand, there's a whole science behind why. Because first of all, they sound different, and um, matching a lavalier to a boom when you're primarily using the boom the whole time and you're cutting to the the wired mics for uh, sorry the wireless mics for like a second or two. Um, it's going to give you like some trouble. You're going to, you're going to have to invest some time in making those match. Um, and it's not always seamless. So they're great to have. They're good on wide shots when you don't have any other choices. They're good when you have no other choices, period. Um, 
like let's say something happens to your mic, it goes down, it's not working that day, you have these available. But um, yeah, there are certainly limitations. And again, there are, there are very expensive options that you can invest in in how to fix some of these problems. And even some of those are trial and error. You have to fit, kind of figure it out as you go. So now we're gonna deal with a situation where it's just a, a plain button down shirt. Uh, in this case, you know, it's, he's wearing a t-shirt underneath. You can kind of see, let me know, can camera, camera can see the logo underneath, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of sloppy, but we did it on purpose because we wanted to show that sometimes these white dress shirts are kind of thin. And when you run a black wire underneath them, it can, if you don't tuck it properly, it can be distracting. So where we start with this is there's one method that's generally sort of free and you can this works again with these smaller mics because they're smaller right because they're they're very they're petite they hide well and um they're not as obtrusive as as these guys so what we do sometimes is we'll actually just run it up through the buttonhole and we'll and this would have been better if it was a black button but it's not so just pretend it's a black button and you don't see it, but it would hide decently well. Can we just make sure that we get that? You got it pretty good there. So again, depending on the camera angle and stuff, like this might work really well. You can do it like that. One thing that I like having, and this is one area that I'm gonna tell you, I think it's important to spend a little extra money. This is, uh, it's, it's from Sound Guys Solutions. It's called the Lav Bullet. It looks like a bullet and they sell different this is the, they sell the blank and then they sell the actual adapters that adapt to the different mic uh, plugs, right? So I'm using Sennheiser uh, compatible plugs. So this is the Sennheiser adapter for the blank. And you, you put this on here and this makes dropping the mic down a shirt, down a dress, even down a pair of pants if you have to go to, to an ankle mount, makes it a lot easier. The, this lightweight wire isn't going to get stuck on the clothing. And then you have this awkward situation of somebody trying to like push it down like they're squeezing out the last bit of toothpaste out of a tube, right? So, th I mean, and not that it has far to go, but we would look at that. I forgot to tape it. Let's start over. Let me go ahead and just pop this up. And if you're not distracted like I am, you're going to go ahead and just put a little bit of tape right behind that to hold that in place. Because any little amount of strain you add on it is going to yank it right out of that hole. Now we should be good. And what you can also do in a case like this is you can add a little what they call a tension relief loop. So that once you drop this, if it pulls a little bit, it's not going to yank the mic away. And you're going to want to tape that up as well. So you just tape that maybe down just under the button. A little bit further down. Hey, Rob. Yes, Dan? Um, what would, um, when do you choose to hide mics versus just kind of clipping them to the shirt? Is it like a creative decision? Is it like corporate versus, you know, short film? You know. So the question is, when do you decide to hide a mic versus show it? So. Generally speaking, film, obviously, you want, it, wants, you have to, it has to look natural. It's not supposed to look like a talk show. So you want to hide the mics on something like that. Um, when you're dealing with corporate and you're dealing with, uh, you know, some talking heads or, you know, some promo videos or something, that's really, that's more of a creative decision. Nine times out of ten, the director is going to tell you to hide it because they want it to look as natural as possible. Um, so I always come prepared, ready to hide every mic. It's a blessing if I show up and they say, oh, no, no, it's okay if we see it, just clip it on the tie. Because that, I mean, that's two seconds. You throw it on, you make sure that it's in place good and you're done, right? Uh, but when you start hiding them, obviously you can see it takes a little bit of time. You have to kind of think it through. There's a lot of trial and error, even at, even at you know, I've been doing this for years now and you st I still show up sometimes and like something that's been working for weeks doesn't work that day and you just have to pivot. One thing I will say is um, in terms of professionalism, my, my advice to students, especially always before you go out into the workplace is never let the client see you sweat. So you could be bombing. Don't look like you're bombing. Look like, oh yeah, no, that happens. I got it. it I'm just gonna, yeah. You know, oh, the mic fell. Oh, I'm just, it, that, that's okay. It's just, you know, I was getting ahead of myself trying to explain the process and I forgot to tape it, but it's okay. You know, two seconds and we're done. Now you could be, you know, super nervous and thinking that you just blew it. You're never going to work again. But if you show them that fear, then you're, that's when you're never going to work again. 
So back to this, so lav bullet, a little weighted end on the end of the microphone wire, and we just drop it down here, and that's gonna go straight down. Now, again, like I said, didn't have very far to go because his, his shirt's tucked, but that's fine. Uh, we'll, we'll revisit this with the t-shirt. And we just pull these through. And again, if it were a stranger, I'd ask him if he'd want to pull it through. I'd let him kind of steer that ship in that in that case. Um, but I'm okay. We're okay with this right here. Now, actually, what I'm going to have you do is because we're down here, just take this wire without yanking it down and just kind of tuck it into under your like where your belt would be. Yeah, just just this one. Yeah, just just tuck it in. We're going to bring no no. We're going to bring it around, and you're just gonna you're just gonna tuck that slack in. just to show you know, what you would do if, they're, if you were on camera. Now again, if this was a sit down, you're likely not getting you know, waist up. It's probably, the camera's gonna probably be around here. So this isn't really even much of a concern. That's good. And just throw that in your pocket. So let's go ahead and see how that sounds, hiding it right there behind the button. Okay, so just uh, count to 10 again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. And just pace around a little bit and count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Much, much cleaner than what we were getting out of the jacket. Um, I don't ever want to see that thing again. Uh, so th there's an option right there. Now that's very low cost. It works if the colors match. Obviously for today, black on white doesn't really work as well, but with a small enough mic. Um, I, Dan, you tell me, does the white, have, does the white see the capsule? Barely. Barely. Okay, so I probably could have spent a little more time, maybe done a little bit better. Uh, you can buy these microphones in white. They come in beige. Um, the white ones tend to get dirty really quickly. I don't buy them because everybody that I know that has them is constantly complaining about, you know, how do you clean them? You can't wet them, right? Because they're not waterproof. It's not one of the waterproof lines. So if we had a white mic, that would hide behind a white button really well. And again, this is where, you know, I didn't have white available, but if I did, I would be, again, I'd be saying, hey, Mr. Producer, what's talent wearing? Do you know, are they gonna wear a blue shirt, a uh, black shirt, white shirt? And I'd try to, you know, pack accordingly for the day. Now, if we don't, for, for this reason, if we don't have the ability to hide it seamlessly behind a button, we can hide it in between the folds of the shirt where the, where the button strip goes. And for this, again, uh, we can use the, we can use the right coat stickies, which, work like a charm. We can use, um, we can use these little Ursa foamies, which are basically just little, they're basically makeup sponges with a hole in the middle, but they're cut and shaped in a way that, you know, they're, they can charge you $20 for 15 of them, you know, but you can go to, you know, your local CVS and you can buy like a hundred of these for $3. And if you've got a few minutes, I'm going to show you how you can go ahead and make basically the exact same mic mount for, you know, $3. So we're going to start with one of these makeup sponges. Tear one off. Hey Rob, at the end, um, yes, sir. You, can we email out a short list to people of like the stuff that, that's in your kit? Absolutely. So I actually glad you asked that. So the question was uh, if I can supply a, a shopping list for people who want to build a little DIY kit. And glad you asked that because I actually do have a list on standby in my email. So remind me before I leave. I'll send that to you and anybody who. Uh, how do they? How how will they get it? Do they? Uh, so they sign up through Eventbrite. So okay. I'll just uh, do like a little email blast. Okay. So anybody who signed up through Eventbrite, we have your email, your address, your blood type, your social. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have your contact info. We're going to send you that. And um, for anybody who's watching this later, uh, feel free to contact me, and um, you know I'd be happy to send you the list, the little shopping list of what what you can buy. So we're gonna start with this makeup sponge. We're gonna chop off the, the wedge end and we're gonna be kind of stuck with this, this square, right? Now, if you compare it, if you compare it to the foamy, you know, height-wise, it's not that different. And then really, it's just a matter of kind of trimming this down to be about the same size and shape. So this is where, you know, if you went to art school or you know, if you just if you just like to do a lot of arts and crafts and stuff, and you know how to shape things, this is where that kind of hobby life kind of comes in handy. So I have one that was already started, and just doing some trimming on it, just to get it sort of ovalish, where it's not going to take up too much space and call attention to itself. And 
And again, you know, like I've I've sat up nights before a shoot knowing that I was going to need a bunch of these and I just spent like an hour at my kitchen table making a whole bunch, making an absolute mess, pissing off my wife. Why are all these scraps everywhere? Um, you know, because I'm working. Uh, you can use the scissors. If you have good pointy ones, just go ahead and bore a hole through the middle. Um, I used to carry a small screw, which I've lost, um, but a little screw would help too, just to kind of twist it through here and make the hole. You can use the one that fell out of your slate. <laughs> we, don't, we don't talk about that, Dan. We don't, we don't talk about the screw that fell out of the slate. So I'll go ahead and take this from you. No, no, keep that. And we're just going to take this, this, now we cut the foam down, we put a little hole in it, and it, it may resist a little bit because it's not the perfect way of boring a hole, but if you can kind of get push it through, you can break through the material a little bit. And there we go. Now we basically have an Ursa Foamy that, you know, is like pennies rather than dollars each. And then from there, go ahead and we can do the same thing. Again, just to kind of keep this low tech, low budget, make another little tape football. And if you, if you have a uh, double sided tape like top stick, or if you have, if you already have some, some right coat stickies, you can absolutely use those. Uh, what sometimes works too is uh, corn pads. So for, you know, foot care, corn pads, a little like little donuts of, of, um, of foam with an adhesive backing. You can even use something like that if you're clever with it. And we're just gonna go ahead and stick that here. And right here where the buttons overlap. Let me hide this in here. And now it's hidden. And unless he leans back and puts strain across the fabric in the front, like if you lean back a little with your shoulders, no, like, see there you can kind of see a little bit of a bulge where it is. But Again, if he's sitting down, or if it's just a normal conversation, a walk and talk, or if he's on, you know, he's on screen, you're shooting a scene with a with a scene partner, you know, you can kind of cut around that. So let's go ahead and see how that sounds. Cool. Walk around a little bit and count for me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm happy with it. Um, you hear the breathing, which is totally normal. You hear a little bit of the footsteps, which you may or may not want. And what we're not getting is a whole bunch of shirt rustling noises. What you're basically doing with these is you're basically making a very small shock mount for the microphone, right? So it sits in this nice little cloud of foam and the capsule is separated away from the fabric. So unless the fabric is noisy, the fabric rubbing on itself is creating noise, like what we were having with the jacket, um, you're not gonna get a whole lot of that here and the capsule stays away from the fabric, so it's not touching it, and you generally don't have all that clothing rustle. It, you're still gonna get some, it's still possible, depending on what he has to do in the scene. If this isn't an interview and you're shooting a short film and he's in a scene, maybe he's chasing somebody down a hallway or something, um, you're definitely gonna get some, some impact noises. And again, just I'm just gonna beat you over the head with it, the boom is king. You're always going to want to go to the boom first and foremost for all of your audio. Um, and again, and, you know, if, if it is a chase scene, maybe you can't boom. Maybe you can't keep up with them. Maybe the blocking doesn't work. Maybe you don't have the space to run behind the camera or in front of the camera or whatever you're going to do. Uh, and so in that case, getting it as clean as possible here is going to be the best way to start that. So from here, um, we can also do some other stuff, and I'm not going to do the breakdown here and show you, but another option that I've done a few times, and again, in a hurry, if it's a little bit, uh, if you're pressed for time, like we've, I've, done, I've done work with nonprofits where we've done 15 interviews in a day, and they're all back-to-back, -back, and they're very busy people, and you don't have a lot of time to waste, right? So rather than doing these complicated setups with a whole bunch of tape and custom-made things and everything, um, sometimes I just go ahead and tape right on the underside of the collar. Just... Tape the mic right here, fold it down. As long as, as long as the side with the mic is facing the camera, you're not looking down the angle seeing underneath, you're, you're generally fine. It's gonna sound okay, it's close enough to his mouth, it's still avoiding that, that shadow, that acoustic shadow, because it's kind of off on the side here, it's gonna pick up the wraparound of the signal, um, and you're good. 
you know, if he starts moving around, you know, popping his collar, rustling his clothes, that's going to be an issue, but that's going to be an issue no matter what. Honestly, even, uh, even a well-placed, well-mixed boom is going to occasionally pick up on stuff like clothing noise if they're physically manipulating their wardrobe in the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and take this off, and we're going to break this back down to a t-shirt now. So, and the nice thing about these is that, you know, if you're spending a whole lot of money on expensive foam mounts and stuff, and, you know, you're, spending, you're dropping $20 on a bag of just a handful of them, you might want to try to reuse them. But generally, as you add adhesive to them and take it off, you, you actually start pulling the material away and they start to break down. Um, so again, the nice thing about these makeup sponges are super, super cheap. That's not a huge investment. If you have to throw away 10 in a day, you've got another 90 and you still you spend three bucks on it. So again, super convenient, really easy for low budget situations or beginners. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this from you. I'm gonna need that back. And go ahead and pull that out, perfect. And go ahead and take that button down off. So uh, Dan, anything else while we wait for the wardrobe change? I asked if anyone had any questions, I didn't get anything yet. No new questions, no all new right. Questions. I, I mean, I'm either, either nobody's watching or I'm doing a fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's nine people watching right now, maybe 10, so I'm kind of disappointed in them. I mean, I can't do anything about the numbers. Yeah. All right. So now we've got your, your probably your most typical wardrobe, right? I mean, low budget films, indie films. Everybody's just kind of sitting around an apartment, drinking beer, talking about stuff, right? Isn't that how they all go? That's, that's all of them, right? No? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have a bunch of people sitting around wearing a t-shirt <laughs> or a hoodie or something, um, it, might, it might actually be a little tricky, right? Because you were able to see how we were able to use elements of the wardrobe in other, at, you know, in other moments here where we were able to kind of hide the them wires and stuff within, and it's, it's pretty simple. But, you know, we know like t-shirts, if they're a little tighter or if you move a certain way, they pull, they, they get taut and they kind of show stuff, right? So hiding wires in, in these situations is a little bit harder. Um, and you could, again, if you have a good level of comfort with the talent and a good rapport, um, you know, you could yourself, if you're brave enough, if you're comfortable with it, you could actually go ahead and, and do a full tape job down, you know, down their stomach, down their side, down their back, or wherever you're running it. You could have somebody else do it for you. You could ask them to do it. Uh, or you can just kind of work with what you have, which is my general motto. So what I'm gonna what I'm gonna start with in this situation is I'm looking at the shirt and I'm seeing how it sits on him and I'm thinking about you know what are we gonna be doing? So again, is this a sit down or not an interview, but are you just is it a scene where you're just sitting on a couch talking to somebody, right? Um, if that's the case, again, you don't have to worry about any blocking, nobody's getting up and moving. So I mean we could throw the pack behind him, throw it on a belt, and you know, it doesn't really matter if it's exposed because the camera's not gonna see that. Uh, so we're going to start there, and then I'm going to show you what you can do if there is a bunch of movement and someone's going to be turning around on camera, and you might catch a glimpse of it. So the first thing that I see is I could potentially, right here on the collar, because it's the thicker area of the material because it's, it's sewn over and you know, it has some texture, we could go ahead and hide the mic right here on the inside. And that's a, that's a solid option. That's where a lot of people tend to go. Could also just go right ahead again with my thumb, just go ahead and, and set up a, 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 what we call a moleskin sandwich and tape the mic right to his skin. And that's gonna help because I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you why. Here's what's gonna happen if, if we go ahead and we use just a, a regular sticky and we put the mic on a flimsy t-shirt You're going to see that um, it doesn't it works, but you're going to see you're going to see the mount because of the weight, right? So if we go ahead and just a little off bullet, okay, just going to make this simple. Drop this down. See, no snagging, no wasted time. Now, if we go ahead and pull this through. And we go ahead and we attach this right to the shirt. In some cases, it'll work. 
right? But see what we're getting now? Like we're getting like the weight of the microphone and the weight of the mount is kind of pulling the shirt down. Some shirts won't do this. Some are made of thicker material. They're gonna be a little more hardy. But in this case, the shirt's just a little too flimsy for this approach. Now the sound might be fine, but it's not gonna, you're gonna know there's a mic there and it's not gonna look right. The director's gonna have a fit and you, know, you, you, you wanna go home on time, right? So you don't wanna have to reshoot the same scene 30 times. So instead of doing that, we can take the exact same thing, and this adhesive might be a little dead now from the cotton, but we can even just go right, right to his skin right here. You don't have to go down too far. That might hold, it might not hold. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a fresh adhesive on this, just to be sure. Because once you attach something to clothing, if there's any lint, it's gonna, it's gonna do some damage to the tack. Just hold that for me. And if we want to keep the shirt off of the adhesive, because you know this is double-sided, so once it sticks to his skin, there's still going to be some exposed adhesive facing out. We don't want the shirt catching on it and you know ultimately pulling. Um, we can go ahead and we can put one of these little windscreens on it. And again, it's not to stop wind; it's just to kind of take away the stickiness here and make sure that we don't ab accidentally snag the shirt. Pull that down a little. Right there. And we can go right here by the sternum. And again, if it was somebody that wasn't comfortable with this, I'd hand it to them prepared. And I'd, I'd tell them, I'd show them on myself, I'd say, what I'm gonna have you do, is you're gonna, you're gonna run this wire down and you're gonna stick the mic right about here. And I've been doing that for years. Barely ever had had anybody need any help. And if I do, if, if it seems like an uncomfortable situation, I get somebody else to help keep myself clear of any problems because I don't need problems and now we're going to go ahead and test this out hold that all right so just pace and count for me okay. one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so again um it's cleaner than the jacket was. It's about on par with how the tie was. So you're getting a little bit of that uh, fabric moving around. But most importantly, his voice is clear and loud enough. He's louder than the noise. So if you need to go in to post and do some noise reduction, you have that ability. You're going to be able to separate them well enough. You might even just be able to go in and make very selective cuts around the words if you need to. And again, that's with him moving around. If he were sitting still, it would be, it would be much less of a problem. So from here, I want to do, I'm going to keep the mic where it is, and I want to talk about these straps. Now, these, these straps are made by Ursa, and they're pretty, they're pretty cool because, so here, this is a pouch, and this pouch is made for the G-series receivers, uh, sorry, transmitters. And, you know, they're neoprene, they're stretchy, sort of water resistant. You drop the pouch in here, and there's belt loops. And then you would go ahead and just take this neoprene you know, again, water resistant Velcro closure strap, and you would wrap it around the person's stomach. They have smaller ones if you're doing like a, a, a thigh mount or an ankle mount or something, you can do that as well, uh, depending on what, you know, your talent is wearing. But let's say he's in a t-shirt and we can't, you know, he's gonna be moving around a lot in the scene. He's gonna be talking to somebody, turning his back to the camera. You don't wanna see the pack sitting there. You don't, you don't even, maybe you don't wanna see the bulge where it meets the, you know, the pants on, on the belt. So you could go ahead and you can spend some money on these straps. They're well worth it. They're well made. They're great. I've used these on athletes when we were doing some sports camps. And for guys that run around and sweat and are moving constantly, jostling stuff, stuff's falling off them if you don't put it on right, these have been a big, big help. Um, but if you don't have the money for that, you can go to your Walmart or your CVS or your Walgreens and these little straps here, these little just... You're, they're just your, like your ace bandages essentially, but without, don't get the ones with the pin closure, get the ones with the Velcro. It's just gonna be a lot easier. You don't want to start pinning stuff onto people near their skin if you don't need to. For one, if it comes loose and you lose it, someone might step on it. Uh, for two, if it comes loose and then they lean back on it, you could end up piercing them and you don't want anybody injured. That's not the name of the game. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna hide this 
pack and the wire under his shirt so that he can then spin around on camera and whatever blocking the director has intended for him will be fine. I think we have a question. You mentioned that the Ursa packs are waterproof. I'm assuming that you can wash them instead of replacing them. Yeah, um, yeah. These are these are washable. You throw these these straps. You throw them in like a little like a garment bag or something for your wash, just so they don't get you know lost in with stuff. Um, throw it in on gentle, and you can wash them and reuse them. And you know it's great because yeah, you're going to be putting these on someone's skin again. You know athletes and stuff like where I've applied them to athletes, they've been sweating. We've been out in the sun all day. Um, they're drenched when I get them back. It's gross. I throw them in a Ziploc bag so I don't have to touch them, you know, and then I <laughs> throw them and wash them later on. Uh, it's, it's not, look, that's why I said this isn't the most glamorous, <laughs> this isn't the most glamorous work. It's fun stuff. It, it, it's, it's necessary, but there's some gross moments in what we have to do. So we're going to go ahead and set up the strap on you. So if you just go ahead and lift up your shirt a little yep. bit. Come around. And we start in the front. Hold that. And you pull it nice and tight. Is that uncomfortable? That's good. Nope. It's good? That's okay, good. perfect. So now, just give me that pack out of your pocket. Oops. Now I'm gonna wind up some of the excess wire. Just lift your arm. And we come around the back and we can, now if you want to, you can go ahead and actually tuck this wire in under everything. Just spin for me, face camera. And then we're gonna take this and we're gonna, turn more. And we're gonna put this right in between the layers. And putting it in between, you can put it on the outside, but the reason I put it in between is because these packs have these little lights. And if you're, if you're dealing with a lighter material or a lighter colored material, you could potentially end up seeing the light through through the shirt if you're not careful. Uh, you can also face it inward. Some people complain, can complain that it gets a little hot on their skin after a few hours because these packs do generate heat. They're wireless, you know, they're electronics. It's going to happen. Um, and generally, just for a quick setup, there we go. Now, I would be normally taping this down or having somebody tape it down if I needed to. This is just a little puffy for me, but uh, if you go ahead. Careful, the, the, this came off the. Oh, we have a problem on set. Okay, so, yeah. It was, it was pulling a little yeah. bit. Yeah, so we pulled a little too much on this and the adhesive came loose. So, we just redo it. And these are all things that happen. I mean, this is, we're just kind of like solving problems in real time here. Um, you might get one end of the setup good to go and then realize that something came loose somewhere at the start and you have to start over. I have a question. There, there's a like for chest hair. Chest hair. Yeah. Yes. Um, I, <laughs> I had this last time I, I, I went over this stuff. So I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, all right, so you're, you're good again. Cool. So, not that this needs another test because we already heard what it sounds like. But go ahead, go ahead and walk, and then just spin. So I want to just like go and turn your back to the camera. A couple oh, okay. Times. This is what people can see. So now you don't see any wires hanging down. You're not seeing the pack, right? If it's if it's done right, you don't see the pack. It's all contained underneath the shirt. Um, you can do the same thing. Some people hide them on bra straps and things like that. I haven't been in that situation. Or no, one time I was in that situation and I had wardrobe do it. Because again, that's that's kind of trouble I don't need. So I go ahead and I get the wardrobe lady. I discussed with her, how are we best going to hide this? So the, the actress is wearing like sort of a halter top with like a little short like sweater kind of thing over it. And I was a little concerned because she was going to be turning her back to camera a lot. She was moving around a little bit. And, you know... There was the potential there that if everything wasn't in and secure properly, that we might, you know, we might end up showing the pack. And it, to me, you know, aside from obviously getting the best mix that I can, making sure everything is hidden is like one of my major, major concerns because you don't want to, you don't want to have a really good sounding, good looking film. And if somebody goes ahead and actually sees a wire or a pack sticking out and it takes them out of it, you might have just ruined the experience for them. So. I have had the, on the occasion where I have to get somebody involved to go ahead and put a pack somewhere. And again, let them do it, get a PA to do it, get the director to do it, get somebody else to do it. If you don't feel comfortable, if you feel comfortable, go for it. 
I know lots of professionals who are used to it, totally fine with it. Um, go ahead and do it. I like to be a little bit more cautious, so leave that up to leave that up to somebody who's who's willing to go ahead and do that. So this is good. We're sounding good here. So the last thing, one of the last things I wanted to go over uh, was the plant mic, right? So I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that on you. Turn that input off for now. We don't need it. And so I want to go back to. I want to go back to first off this boundary mic, because on occasion you might only have this available. So why don't we go ahead and just going to move this a little bit? And I have a literal, I have a literal plant here for the plant mic. Um, that won't always be the case. Oh, is it? It's out of frame. It's not out of frame, but it, at least it'll be close to you, and it'll be tighter. Sure, sure. How's that? Better. Actually. I mentioned the moleskin sandwich, and I would be doing you guys a disservice if I didn't go over this really quickly because this is actually one of the most common ways of mounting. Uh, so again, moleskin is basically thin felted pads of fabric with adhesive on the back. And when you are going to mount a microphone, if you don't have some of these other tapes and adhesives available, you can always very easily run to the drugstore and get a few sheets of this. I buy like three sheets at a time. Sometimes I'll buy a few packs of it and I cut them down in advance and I keep them in different sizes here. And the chest hair question uh, will actually help us with this. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna actually go ahead and, and unmic him for this. I'm gonna use a, a spare mic and just show the technique here. So the moleskin sandwich is basically, you're going to take you're going to take one strip of moleskin and you're going to place the mic on the sticky side with the capsule out and make like sort of wings here. And then you're going to take another strip of moleskin about the same size and you're just going to make a sandwich out of it, hence the name. Now from here, if you want to tidy it up, you can go ahead and trim the ends so they're not so long. I like to just you know, trim this down because if it's too big, it can be kind of cumbersome. And from here, now you have this, this is nice and it's, it's fairly insulated. You will still get some rubbing if things are touching it, but it's a way of kind of attaching the microphone to a sticky surface if you don't have a bunch of these other things available. And the plus side is that it's not double-sided like those right coat stickies where you have to waste your felts on the front and stuff just to, to keep it from sticking to things. Now, you would just peel off the backer of this adhesive and then you would just kind of stick this either on the clothing, on the skin, anywhere that you would have applied a lot of these other methods that we're using today, you can go ahead and do the same thing with a moleskin sandwich. Now, the question uh, that somebody asked about what do you do if someone has a really hairy chest? So if I were miking myself, I mean somebody with a really hairy chest, um, <laughs> You, uh, you could, listen, I mean, you could talk to them about if they'd be comfortable with shaving a square. Uh, the makeup, you know, hair and makeup department might possibly have something for that. Hopefully clippers and not tweezers where they have to sit there pulling out hairs one by one. But, you know, if they're giving you some trouble, maybe send them to the tweezers. But um, one thing that we can do is you take a larger portion of moleskin and you essentially make just a larger moleskin sandwich. So in this case, let's just say, let's just say, uh, you know, you can't get this microphone on him and he's got a really hairy chest and it's hard to stick it to him and you put it on the clothing and you're, you're hearing the mic on the clothing touching the hair. So if he, we, would, we would take his shirt off and we would stick a large square of moleskin on his skin, right? I'm doing it over the shirt just for demonstration. And that's gonna create a much larger area of adhesion, right? So less of a risk of the hair getting in the way of, of the actual adhesive, blocking it from the skin. There's a lot more opportunity for, this, for the glue to get to the skin despite the hair in this, in this situation. Because really the problem is that the, 
the hair gets the hair blocks the glue and it doesn't allow it to adhere well right you're going to have a lot of issues with it falling off um and in addition to it falling off you'll have the noise so this creates a nice big sort of safe area away from the hair for the mic to sit and then you would just take your moleskin sandwich and place it right middle-ish right not not too far to the edges because that defeats the purpose and then it's right there if there's a shirt over this you don't see it the hair's not a problem anymore. You might still have to do whatever tricks you have to do to insulate the mic from the shirt, but you're in, you're in, good, sh you're in a good starting shape here doing it this way. Um, so that's it. That's the moleskin sandwich, and that's the body hair issue that we touched on. So now let's go ahead to the plant mic because I, I did promise we would come back to that. So let's say you're filming... Uh, you can go take a seat over there. Let's say you're filming a sit down and maybe maybe you brought the maybe you didn't bring your cardioid mics and you only have a boom, uh, sorry, a shotgun and you're not able to successfully pick up, you know, both voices because we'd be off axis. And I don't know, maybe you're shooting in an office building in Manhattan with cell phone towers right outside the window because that's happened. Um, and you can't get your wireless to work because I've been there and it's a thing. Um, you need another option, right? So everyone's going to be off access with this. And if you don't have a boom up or if it's just going to be too difficult of a situation, maybe it's a 40 minute interview. You don't want to stand there for 40 minutes. Your arms are going to fall off and you're not going to be able to, you know, really focus on your levels and make sure everything is recording properly. So if you have either a boundary mic like this or even just a spare lavalier, let no. I know the lavalier thing because I just said the wireless isn't working. Maybe you have a wired lav. You can go ahead and actually set this mic up behind. Now, I'm just going to talk to you like you're dumb because I don't know if you know, the, you know what a plant mic is. A plant mic doesn't necessarily mean a plant. It's just it's a mic that's planted out of sight. Now, for effect, I like to actually throw a plant in the demonstration just to show because I'm, I'm, I'm kooky like that. And we would just go ahead and get this ready in advance, which I didn't do. Dan, why didn't you tell me to get this ready in advance? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go around here. Now, you'd have to work with your set design and, and kind of figure out what's going on here. But let's just say we know that we're not seeing anything lower than here. So if you have some wires on the ground, it's not the end of the world. It's not a big deal. And if we're plugged into five, okay. So real quick, just count for me. Ready? Count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Stand by one second. Can you just let me know if you guys were getting that over there? Do it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, here it says very uh, faint. No problem. Give me one second. All right, count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, Better. seven. So what happened there was I, I don't often have to use uh, faders five through eight, so I have them set to mute. So just had to go ahead and undo that. So I'm actually going to temporarily just turn my mic off. So we're just going to use the plant mic. And we'll get a sense for what this sounds like for just being sort of a room mic that you're just hiding in place here. And again, so let's say this is a uh, this is a talk show. You, you, all, you all heard of uh, between two ferns, right? So this is between two idiots. We're interviewing the plant, and it's sitting between two idiots. So um, plant. Uh, so uh, I don't know. So let's do something a little bit better than counting. Uh, oh, you have a question? Can you turn the boom a little bit there? Yeah. Is that blocking my my thing? Okay. So um, Nico. Uh, yeah. 
Are there any movies coming out that you're excited for? Uh, yeah, uh, one in particular, uh, the new Mortal Kombat movie. Oh, I'm the, sure you he- you've heard of it. I have heard about the new Mortal Kombat movie. It looks yeah. uh, it looks like it's going to be a hell of a lot better than the one we had from years ago. That's yes, for sure. definitely. Yeah, less. Yep. Probably less. I hope less cheesy. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking the CGI might be a little bit better. Should be. Yeah. So who's Should your favorite be. character? Um, probably Scorpion would be my favorite. And what about you? That Scorpion is the correct answer. If anyone says anything other than that, <laughs> you're wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, so how does so you know you guys can hear the way that sounds? Now that's you know, that's picking up probably a lot more of the room noise as well. You're probably hearing maybe if there's some HVAC or just some hum in general. When he talks, it's really good, but you have more of the room tone. So I have a little bit more of the room tone, um, and that's the tricky thing with these, right? This is this was sort of facing him a little bit more. So you can tape them down so they don't move. Again, I just kind of placed it here quickly for this, and it happened to move when I moved the wire. So how about now? So for, uh, yeah, again, so, you know, I mean, Sub-Zero is a good second choice. Right, right? yeah. So, I mean, he's not quite Scorpion, though. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's probably a little bit better now, right? And, again, you know, these are things you play around with, like mic placement, things, things moving, things change, just kind of, this is why we arrive early. This is why we test our equipment before we start rolling. This is why we ask questions about where things are going. Um, I have had many occasions where I've planted a, a plant mic in a plant, and they work to varying degrees. Sometimes they're just sort of an insurance policy to make sure that you're getting something just in case. Other times they've had to be the primary pickup source, and you have to just sort of work with picking up that, that extra room tone. Question. Off topic, but uh, you're mentioning kind of safeties and, and making sure that you're prepared and have always a backup. Uh, when you get on set and you're working with a DP or just a camera operator, are you making suggestions on how their cameras should be set? And if they have uh, um, shotgun mics um, on their cameras, like are you being involved with that or do you kind of walk in and they should uh, you know, have uh, knowledge for themselves? Uh, so the question was, if when I walk on set, do I start giving suggestions or collaborating with other departments on how they should have their settings, what kind of equipment they should use? Um, I think that filmmaking is a collaborative effort. I think that it's one of the few industries where if you don't work successfully as a team, everybody fails. But I wouldn't go as far as say that I would tell anybody what to do. I would ask what they're doing. I would tell them what would be optimal for us to work together in the best way, you know, in the, the most uh, successful way. But ultimately, their department is their business. The only time that crosses over is, uh, and again, this is a little bit more of an advanced topic, but if I'm sending time code sync out to camera, out to a slate, uh, possibly even to another recorder, sometimes you're working on, I did a, I did a large documentary shoot where we actually needed two sound mixers and we didn't for that uh, we didn't sync our, our bags together but uh, that was an option the, if the director had needed it for post we were prepared to you know use a quick BNC cable to join the mixers together and make one the receiving end of, of the you know uh, taking the external time code and one being what they call the master um, and you can do it that way. So where mounting my gear or connecting my gear to camera is concerned, that in, in those places, I'll typically be a little more, uh, uh, not aggressive, but a little more stern about what we need. You know, director needs this, they need a clean uh, wireless hop, you have to make room on your rig for, for a wireless pack. Or you know, we absolutely have to have time code, uh, do you want wireless time code or do you want to just do a jam sync? And then, you know, in that case, let me know anytime you power down. We'll jam it again to make sure that everything is synced up. But uh, generally, no. Like, I won't, I won't just approach a DP who has a shotgun mic on for scratch purposes and say, hey, man, you know, don't, don't use that. It, at the end of the day, whatever they feel they need to capture for their project is between them and the director. And if that's what they have available and that's what's working for them, then fine. Now... It's only different, again, if the director says, hey, we need a wireless hop, I want to hear the boom straight out of your bag, or I want to hear the full mix out of your bag, send me everything, wireless, plant mics, boom, everything. Um, then I'll have to approach them and say, hey, listen, you know, at that point, it's not what I want, it's what the boss wants, right? It's the, the guy writing the check tells me what, what we need to do, and then I just go ahead and do it. So that wraps up this episode of Between Two Idiots.
I'm going to go ahead and turn my mic back on, turn that one off. All right. So that was uh, pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Um, are there any other questions from the web or from the room? Question? Um, personally, because I have a film that I'm going to be shooting this weekend, and it may be a little rainy, do you have any tips on like how to cut noise down with uh, just rain ambiance? So cutting down the noise of the, of the rain. So are these interior shots? Exterior. Exterior shots. Um, honestly, that's pretty difficult. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, it, I'm, I'm assuming the rain's going to be seen in the shot, right? Yeah. So it's, pra it's a practical noise. Like it's, it's there, you see the rain. It would be weird if you cut it down too much. Um, at the same time, if it's overpoweringly rainy, it might start to, no pun intended, drown out the dialogue. <laughs> um, I would say if it, if it's an issue, wait, wait, watch the pattern. See if there's like if it's coming in waves. If it's if there's lulls in in how heavy it comes in. Try to shoot most of your coverage. You know when it's not too bad, mm -hmm. um, because removing rain is an enormous obstacle. Right. It's very very. It's one of the noises that's actually very hard to get rid of because it's so random. The noise itself is so random. It's hard to get a good solid sample of it and then and then remove it based on the sample. Uh, so I would say either wait for times when it's not as intense and shoot then mm -hmm. and just try to keep it as consistent as possible or just completely own it, you know, um, even add more rain in post, you know, more rain noises in post just to even out sections that weren't even when you were recording. Um, that's a creative decision, though, not so much a technical one, because you really are limited uh, technically in that situation. There are there are water proofing methods there are you know ways of pr protecting your gear from the rain but that's strictly just the gear itself but your your footage and the audio that you're getting is, is going to be susceptible to that that's an environmental hazard would uh like the put the cover on your mic be a good idea just to have like um oh this the yeah, yeah i mean i always recommend so this is just your standard your standard windscreen i always recommend having these on even indoors because if you are moving the boom around, you might create some some you know air passing through the 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 actual um, tube here. Uh, so this just helps that. But I would be careful with this outside. It won't get saturated until it does. You know, like the water will beat up and and roll off of it until it's suddenly soaking in. And at that point, you're risking too much humidity getting into the tube and doing damage to your electronics. Uh, it's it's almost not worth it. You know, if you can't properly protect it uh, and keep it shielded from the rain it's almost not worth shooting that day and just delaying things right. you can buy some rain covers and stuff i mean the, the prices vary they can get pretty pricey but if you consider the cost of the microphone uh having to replace that is going to cost you a lot more you know i mean a good mic is going to start you around 600 bucks and you know maybe the rain covers 200 mm -hmm. so you know that's that's totally up to you if that's within reach some people wrap plastic bags around them you're going to hear the plastic bags though mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's going to be your choice what about sorry to keep talking about no, go ahead. like an umbrella would that like with the rain hitting the umbrella be a little bit too much because i think trying to shield it with an umbrella yeah you you would potentially be hearing the 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 sort of echoey pitter patter of the rain on the umbrella it's going to sound different from the rest of the the rain noise you're getting mm -hmm. and it's going to call attention to itself um, that would definitely, yeah, I wouldn't, I would have, unless your characters are walking in the rain and have umbrellas and you could maybe blame it on that. Like you could perceivably kind of push that effect off on, on that. Yeah. Darren asked, what's your favorite brand of mic? My favorite brand of mic. Um, I actually, I really do like the road mics for their shotguns. And, um, you know, a lot of this is subjective. Like people will get into heated arguments for days on Facebook about, oh, my Sennheiser is better than your Rode. To me, the best mic is the one I have with me and as long as it works. Um, but I, I like the, 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 the price for the power that it packs. Um, you know, it could move up to something like the Sennheiser 600, the 466 or any of those. And here I am rattling off numbers, hoping that I have them right. But, uh, you know, you can start getting into $1,000 or more mics. I mean, the, uh, 
the, the CMIT 5U from uh, Sheps or Shopes or however you say it, um, that's like a two or $3,000 microphone. It's like, I mean, it's the, it's the tippy top, the best. But, um, you know, damn, I'd really hate to have that on, uh, on set and somebody accidentally knocks over my boom stand and, and my mic gets ruined. Um, in terms of wireless, uh, I really, really like the Sankin mics. Uh, DPA makes some good ones. Um, if you want something waterproof, the, the Countryman B6, I believe, is the waterproof model. It's super tiny, or it might be the B3. I'm drawing a blank specifically on that right now, but those are solid mics. They're very small. They sound a little different from the Sankins. They don't sound uh, necessarily as sharp all the time, um, but they're super small, really easy to hide. There's ways of, if you, uh, especially with theater, they do it a lot, but you could do it in film too, where you actually hide the microphone in someone's hair. Um, and they make special clips for those, and those mics are super small that they're not going to create a bump in the hair. So if there's a very particular hairdo that the, the you know the, the cast member is wearing for their role, it's not going to distract from that and be, and be a problem. So um, but yeah, my, my favorite right now are these Sankin uh, COS 11Ds for my for my wireless lobs and uh, Rode in general. Uh, the NTG3 has served me pretty well. Uh, we don't have any other questions. Does anybody have any last minute questions? Because you probably couldn't hear Dan telling me to ask you that. No, 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 no. <laughs> you know, it's actually funny when he talks and I can barely hear him when you're using your mic, but with the um, plant mic, you could actually hear him a lot better. Yeah, you can, the, the, the plant mic, you know, acting as a room mic is picking up all of this. So yeah, you people watching may have even been able to hear Dan talking to me a little bit from across this huge 100 foot room. It's a big hat, it's funny. It's, big, it's a big place. Well, I mean, if nobody has any other questions, um, what, what time are we up to now? Two hours. Two hours. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if anybody has any other questions that you think of them later, um, hit up the Facebook feed where this is, drop them here, or um, find my info online uh, and, you know, shoot me an email. Uh, my website is www.setandpost.com. You can contact me through there. Um, That's set, S E T. Yes, S E T A N D P O S T, as in onset audio and post production. Uh, setandpost.com, you can contact me through there if you have any other questions. Um, again, hit up the Facebook comments on here. And um, yeah, that's about it. Now, well, thanks to the Strix Media team for putting this together. And is there everything okay over there? Yeah. You good? I don't know how to end it. Oh, we don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> no, I mean, we do. All right. Say bye. All right, thanks everybody. Goodbye.